Okay, so this is Anti-Reflection 101, and I'm Lindsay Vita, and I'm a developer at BrandingBrand.com. And, and hi, everybody. I'm Steve. You just heard me ramble for five minutes. Uh, I work with Jeff at Jumpstart Lab, as I just told you the beautiful story of our origins moments ago. We teach the best Ruby and Rails classes uh, in the world, so if your team needs to like level up at what you do, uh, give us a call, because you know it's awesome. So this talk. Um, so you know, we all love Martin Fowler, right? Like Martin Fowler, like anything that he writes instantly becomes crazy programmer canon, and we like memorize everything he's ever done. Um, so Martin Fowler has this thing called a DSL. So obviously, it's you know 100% awesome, and we in Ruby in particular use DSLs. And a DSL is short for a domain-specific language, if you don't know, um, and that's a computer language that's targeted to a particular kind of problem. So from a certain perspective, Ruby on Rails is a domain-specific language that is used to tackle the application domain of web programming, right? Rake is a DSL that is used to make things. Uh, we tend to use this technique a lot in the Ruby world, and we're like really big advocates of it. So it turns out that many other fields also have their own kinds of domain-specific language, and sometimes this can come into um, friction with the kinds of things that we're used to using words for. So every single field has some things that, that mean um, different to someone in another field, right? So um, it turns out one of the things that I've been really interested in lately is applying the things, lessons from other fields to our own field. So when I see that we have a particular problem, I don't honestly listen to you guys about how to solve that problem. I go like read some philosophy books or like talk to some people that aren't programmers because they're thinking outside of our box. And so it's a really interesting way to like apply their lessons of what they've learned in their field to what we're doing. So uh, as you know, we have a little bit of a problem uh, in our like computer science community and you know um, like web programming sort of not necessarily specifically, but just in general computer science. And it turns out there are other fields that have domain specific languages that let us tackle that problem in a better way than we currently are using with our like generic language to do so. Uh, to solidify this problem, I have this graph here. And what we have is the bachelor's degrees received by women in various STEM fields. And that horrible little like mountain there, that's computer science. And we see that it peaks at 1985. And ever since then, we've been on this negative trend downwards. And that's something that we really, really need to think again and go back on. Because right now, you know, 51% of the US population is women. We make up a large percent of the workforce. Now, right now, we're about like 25% of the uh, bachelor's degrees in computer science are going to women. That's, you know, like half. That's really, really horrible. And while most, like, a large chunk of people using technology are women, very few of them are actually contributing to the code that we're actually using. And there's a similar problem from you know, a racial perspective. Uh, this graph here shows Silicon Valley workers in the dark blue and all US workers in the light blue. And what we can see for uh, black individuals is they are at 6% of the Silicon Valley workforce, but 11% of the overall US workforce. And that doesn't sound like that much of a difference right now until you realize that that is also half. So there's a huge chunk of these people not being involved and same thing goes for the Hispanic population, which is 9% of the Silicon Valley workforce versus 15% of all US workers. So right now, technology is very white and very male. And we need to work <laughs> <laughs> on getting more people involved in using the technology. So, um, so this, this, this field of this terminology that's used, um, and it's called social justice, basically. Uh, and it is, in, in programmer speak, it is a DSL for discussing equality and social relationships. And we can use this DSL to help us like, grapple with these issues. Um, ultimately, the, uh, in uh, American history, this sort of notion of social justice has been associated with like, leftist political movements. But uh, <laughs> actually, if you look at where the term comes from, it's actually um, from Thomas Aquinas and a very like right-leaning perspective. So like this does not have to do with like left versus right politics. I don't even want to get into that. This is about treating human beings as other human beings. And various people from various political sides have like come to believe this is a good idea over you know our history. Uh, and so you know we're not trying to get into those kinds of political discussions. This is about people and humans, not about like politics in some form. Uh, although uh, whatever, yes. Yeah. Ultimately, still <laughs> politics, but not of that kind. Put it that way. Um, so there was this Reddit thread one time, and I don't read Reddit anymore, uh, but uh, it, was, it was pretty awesome. It made me laugh really hard. And um, the question was, uh, what is the worst possible thing you could call a white male person? 
And so uh, the one that everyone got actually upset about was privileged. Um, if you've never heard this term before, we're about to talk in a second, but all the other ones, people were like, oh yeah, you say like cracker. I don't, that doesn't get me mad, right, at all. Like that's not like, a, that's not actually a negative thing. It doesn't hurt me at all. But you insinuate that we have privilege and all of a sudden everyone got really, really upset. Um, so this is like the primary topic as far as attacking this, um, you know, thing uh, that, you know, we want to talk about, so. Okay, so privilege is how, si how society accommodates you. It's about the advantages you have that you think are normal. It's about you being the normal and others being a deviation from the normal. This is you being born just lucky. Lucky enough to be, you know, a white male being sort of like this top rung as far as like the privilege spectrum goes. And, you know, one person related this to being sort of, and, you know, it's one thing that people get very angry about was she wrote that, you know, being a white male is sort of like being on easy mode. So you're playing a game, you set the modes, you still have some difficulty, you still have some challenges, but it's still easier than those people that don't have the advantages that you have. And it's something that you were just given by just being born, it's just luck. The privileged and the unprivileged live on the same planet, but two different worlds. It's not something that you know, you're really aware of. You don't see other people's privilege and how that's really interacting so much until you have that sort of taken away from you. So there's this real cool uh, sociology experiment um, about, uh, Basically, they said, okay, so we're gonna put this video in front of you, and there's gonna be um, two basketball teams. One has white jerseys on, the other one has black jerseys on, and they're gonna pass basketballs back and forth um, between each other. And I want you to count the number of times the basketball gets passed between players. Um, and so then, you know, that went on for like 45 seconds or so, and then they said, okay, so um, what did you think of the gorilla? And people went, the, the gorilla? And uh, they're like, yeah, the gorilla that walked across the middle of the screen, like the guy in the big giant gorilla suit. What did you think about that? And they were like, I don't know what you're talking about. And if you go and actually watch the video, you can find this experiment on YouTube. But um, you get so focused on like paying attention to this task that even though a guy in a gorilla suit walks through a bunch of people shoot, you know, shooting basketball back and forth, you totally don't see it. Like when I did this, I watched the video, I heard about like, oh, this is really interesting, right? It didn't explain it at all at first. I watched this video and I was like totally shocked because I didn't see it either. And this is a fundamental like neurological process of the way that our brains work. We, when we especially when we focus on something, we tend to ignore what's in the periphery, um, like moving the microphone away from my mouth so you can't hear what I'm saying. Uh, and so, um, you know, so this is just, so this is one of the examples, you know, not necessarily of privilege directly, but this kind of perspective. You get, you're so used to what you're used to seeing that it's hard to uh, relate to other people, I guess is kind of the point. And it's also difficult to spot in yourself because it's what you've been like focused on, like what you normally do. And so that's like the real lesson um, is that this sort of privilege is very difficult to notice. Um, you know, uh, again, being like, I'm privileged along every possible axis, right? Straight, white, male, uh, you know, upper middle class, uh, you know, all those kinds of things. And so it's very difficult to, um, to like grapple with this kind of thing um, because I can't experience what like Lindsay experiences being a woman in computer science. It's not even that I can't like empathize, but since I'm not of, you know, I'm not a woman, so I will never have a woman's experiences. Um, yeah. So Steve just kind of slightly mentioned this term, axes of identity. So that's like the things that sort of affect the privilege that you have. And here we have listed five different ones, gender, sexuality, race, class, and ability. But these are only just a couple of the things that sort of affect the privilege that you have. There's a lot of different moving parts at play here. There's a lot of things that greatly affect the privilege that you receive. And it's not something that you know, we can kind of step back and really be aware of until we deeply, deeply try to emphasize. But even then, you cannot fully, fully understand someone else's experience as far as you know, how these axes of identity are interacting and how they're place in society is being affected by this. Um, so intersectionality is a uh, sociology theory of how various biological, social, cultural categories interact on multiple and often simultaneous levels contributing to systematic social in inequality. And this is something that's complete bullshit. I'm just gonna say that because, you know, we shouldn't be judging people on more than, you know, them just being people and when we start looking at them and start making these judgments on them, it's greatly affecting, you know, their place within the world just because of, you know, their their luck, their happen chance to like, you know, have these certain axes of identity interacting and in such a way that, you know, they are not the highest rung of society. Right. And the other thing about intersectionality is that's how it, you know, uh, 
it, sometimes you'll receive certain kinds of privilege in a certain situation and not in others. So, um, you know, these, we are full people. We are not like just a, uh, a white dude or a white woman or a black dude. We are a, a sum of tons of attributes and so they all interact with each other, which is what this concept talks about. Um, another thing that's a really big thing, especially online, you will see endless people talk about this. Um, or in the wrong way, that is. Um, and so like the isms, like namely racism and sexism, um, actually are discrimination plus power uh, equals oppression and therefore like racism or sexism. So this is why you'll hear some people say like, you cannot be racist against white people or you cannot be sexist against men. You can obviously discriminate against men, but without the systematic power that men have in society, you know, you cannot uh, oppress men in the same way that women have been oppressed for thousands of years. So like that's a significant difference. And so, um, so in a social justice context, these sort of words have a slightly different meaning than what people on Reddit uh, tend to say that they are, uh, for example, <laughs> uh, which I shouldn't really even have to say, but I kind of do. So, um, but that's what's important is that it's systemic power. It's not anything about even individuals. It's about the, the power of the group dynamics of the society that we live in. Um, yeah. Um, okay, so the imposter syndrome is something that everyone can be affected by, and it's when people are unable to internalize their achievements despite evidence of competence, they believe they're frauds and undeserving of their you know, ac accomplishments. So it's something that affects everyone, but when you're, say, like a minority in a field and suddenly you know, you're being asked to give a talk and it's like, is it because I'm just a woman? Like, why am I here? And suddenly you're being, like, put all this pressure on yourself and you're just completely unable to accept that yeah, I know what I'm talking about, and yes, I can do this, and it's something that we all you know, deal with, but there are more factors that go into affecting more people greatly with this particular problem. Um, so this is an example, like at the University of Pittsburgh, we are redoing the, uh, our notes said which slide was which people, so that's what we lost, so that's why there's some funny changes. So at the University of Pittsburgh, we had some people from other schools, like we are trying to redo our computer science program, and so we talked to the guy who's in charge of Harvey Mudd, and they had had um, a really massive, um, first of all, downturns in computer science enrollment, but also it, it disproportionately was affecting women and other minorities. And so all they did was have two sessions, um, and, and they asked everyone, like, so every student at Harvey Mudd has to take an intro to computer science class. So all they asked on the entrance exam to the school was, have you ever programmed before? And if you said yes, they put you in CS 101, and if you said no, they put you in CS 102, or whatever. Just splitting those two groups apart. And just by changing that, nothing else about the curriculum, the teachers, anything, they saw a massive increase in enrollment in computer science, period, but also um, the, the women specifically sprung back like crazy. And the reason for this was due to this imposter syndrome. So what would happen is, um, so like I started programming when I was seven, so I don't know what it's not like to not program. So when I went in my freshman you know, computer science class, the teacher's like, uh, you know, y equals x plus five, x equals two, you know, what is y? And I was like, obviously it's six or whatever. And so all the people that had never like done this before or, you know, in the room are like, oh wow, this is really hard for me and that person is doing really, really well. Maybe this is just not my field. And so it turns out that like people who are good were poisoning the discussion and that made it difficult for new people to like enter the field. And so just by making that one simple change in who was in what class, they saw like massive increase of people that are like, yeah, computers are for me because I'm not stupid. So that's sort of a real world example of this kind of syndrome and how these things like interact with each other. I should note that that increase was from 17% to 47%. So they were nearly at gender parity after they sort of made that, that shift. And that was really, really big deal for them to completely change their CS program. And so it wasn't because of lack of interest, it was because there was this massive attrition rate with this initial class where just bunches of people were just dropping out. Okay, so stereotype threat. It's an experience of anxiety in a situation where a person has the potential to confirm a negative stereotype about their social group. This is something that has been proven in numerous and numerous studies time and time again. There was a study, I believe, when it first came out in like 1994 that talked about you know, uh, African Americans taking uh, the standardized tests. And just by basically priming them with the idea that African Americans do worse on the standardized tests, they did worse. And by saying, no, African Americans do the same as everyone else, they did the same as everyone else. What you believe in your mind sort of comes real and it comes into play because you respond with this stress response when you're told you're going to be bad at this. You will be bad at it. The same thing happened with women in math exams. They uh, primed them with gender ahead of time, told them, you know, women generally do poorly, 
and they did worse. The moment that they undid that moment, they said, you know, women do the same, the scores were basically the same and actually slightly better for the women uh, than the men in that math exam. So this, it's so amazing just like how powerful the mind is. When you tell someone something that will sort of like affect the way that they learn, it affect the way that they, you know, are actually able to interact with material. Um, yeah. And I've, I've had women, for example, say like, I don't participate in discussions about feminism in front of people because I don't want to be seen as a bitch. And so like, you know, they will not say anything even as people say terrible things about women in front of them for that reason. So, you know, this kind of thing happens all the time. This is one of my favorite terrible things that people say on the internet about this topic uh, and in our community too. Uh, I can't be sexist because I love women so much. Uh, and like, I, you know, I don't want to point too many fingers, but like this has been the root of the cause of some of the presentations that we've had in the Ruby community where there's been like bad things have been put up on these screens is because of like this justification, which sounds ridiculous on its outset, but like people do, um, you know, uh, believe it. So um, there is that. And then also um, something else, if you do make a faux pas, and you probably will, um, because this stuff is hard, uh, you should definitely apologize honestly whenever you do something that's bad. So um, at LA RubyConf this year, for example, um, I saw a woman tweet like, I'm really excited to meet so-and-so, 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 and Steve. And you know, she had her face as a picture on this you know, Twitter account. And so I saw her at the conference and like following Corey's advice, like, oh, I'm gonna meet new people. Uh, so I walked up to her and said, hey, uh, how's it going? You know, my name's Steve, I saw you tweet about me yesterday. And she's like, yeah. And I was like, I thought that was, what I said was, I was you know, slightly nervous, you meet some new people. Um, and so I said, hey, uh, I thought that was you because you know, honestly, like, how many girls are there here? And like, I felt really, really terrible about that and later went up to her and like, apologized for like, singling her out in that way and like, drawing attention to this kind of thing. Um, and so even though I've been studying these kinds of topics and like, working on developing you know, attention to these kinds of things, you can absolutely screw it up. And she was confused as to why I was apologizing to her because she didn't see that it was like, a problem, but um, I felt really terrible about it and it's important to um, apologize honestly uh, and to not fake apologize if you're not, if you, if you are being a sexist asshole because you are a sexist asshole, you shouldn't make a fake apology about how you're not actually a sexist asshole. <laughs> um, like, basically. Uh, and, and uh, you know, because, like, I am sorry you're offended is not an actual apology, basically. <laughs> and it's terrible I have to say it, but it's true. So, um, but it's important to, like, to make that apology because, uh, you know, it does mean something. Uh, and so, yeah. Oh, enlighten up is not a valid response to someone, you know, being bothered by comments. It's just not. Okay, microaggressions, which I would count lighten up as a microaggression. Um, it's demeaning implications or other subtle insults against minorities. Um, so these things are sort of like, you know, doing dishes is women's work, and sort of these sort of little subtle jabs and implications. You know, you don't really. Obama is so articulate. Yeah, is a that, great example of this kind of thing. Yeah, that's a really big <laughs> microaggression. And there's actually a huge website full of these. So if you're like, I wonder if that's a microaggression, go on microaggressions.com, and they'll see a list of them. <laughs> and I, I actually, I wanted to add one, and then I went through it, and I was like, oh, somebody else already added the one that I was insulted with. Awesome. Um, so they're not even creative. They're just repeating the same things over again. Um, Oh, and uh, frown power. Okay, so the big deal right now is there are a lot of things, and I realize, I feel like it's the, the vocal minority that's sort of pushing out all these sexist and racist things right now. And uh, frown power was sort of co coined in the 1940s um, when uh, Stetson Kennedy was sort of infiltrating the KKK. He was sort of trying to take them down. And it was just like, you know, when someone says something racist, you know, frown in their presence, you know, ma make it known that it's not welcome. Um, but as far as the internet goes, you know, you need to do a little bit more than that and you need to let them know when they get something wrong. And also, when you're having the conversation when someone gets something wrong, it's really important to have it in such a way that they're receptive to you. So instead of saying, you're a racist because you said this thing, you know, like it's hard, people get the stuff wrong. So instead of saying that, you need to say, what you said was racist or what you said was sexist, instead of just calling them out for it and like accusing them of being a racist or sexist, because they might not be, and they just might not understand that what they said was out of line. But it's really important that we get as many people as possible basically you know, calling people out for this because we need to make it known that within the community this type of behavior is not acceptable anymore. Yeah, so um, 
This is sort of a concept that's used often when describing films or media, um, and then the male gaze. So whenever the audience is put in the perspective of a heterosexual male. Um, I actually had a really great example of this yesterday. If any of you follow on Twitter, if you saw the uh, link about um, what if uh, other Olympic sports were filmed like women's volleyball. Okay, and so they had like these screenshots of like what the coverage of women's Olympic volleyball is like, and it was basically just like butts, right? Like that's all, just like total, no body, no legs, like just butts, because uh, that's apparently what beach volleyball is. And uh, so they said like, here's some other Olympic sports that would be filmed in this way, and then cropped and zoomed like men's basketball, um, you know, uh, soccer, like all these other sports. Uh, and it's really illuminating how like, uh, oftentimes media assumes that the audience is in, from this uh, you know, perspective of a heterosexual male, and if you're not, that becomes alienating because you can't relate to the material. So like, when all of our movies and most of our media comes from like, my perspective, it means that other people don't relate to it in the same way that I do, and they're constantly reminded, like, I'm supposed to be thinking that this Olympic coverage is pretty hot right now, but you know, uh, you know, I'm a straight woman, so I'm not really into girls, so obviously this is not meant for me is like kind of the, the reason that this is particularly alienating. And this is really hard to notice as a straight male dude, because like, I'm just like, yeah, beach volleyball, which is terrible. And um, it's something that But is, you don't know. Like, uh, yeah, it's, it's prevalent in tech, right? You know, you've been to conferences, you've seen people trying to sell technology with, you know, scantily clad women. Like, that's something that's really not, a, I'm not gonna buy an iPad because like a woman in a bikini gave it to me. Like, that's not gonna happen. But I mean, that's how the mentality is sort of going, and you know, you need to realize that you know there are more than just heterosexual male in your audience, and you need to you know kind of apply to all of them. No one knew Pinterest was going to be like big, because like everyone in Silicon Valley is a dude, right? And Pinterest's audience is like vastly women, and so all of a sudden everybody's like Pinterest. How did this website get so huge? And that's because like women use a lot of technology too, so you should make things that appeal to them as well as you know uh, dudes on Hacker News. <laughs> I'm just going to skip this. Okay. All right. So I have an awesome quote here. Uh, I would suggest reading it later. I'm not just going to read this quote to you, but it's pretty awesome, and Frances D. Allen is kind of amazing. She's the first female recipient of the Turing Award and kind of one of my heroes. Yeah, so this is sort of what I was saying a second ago. Like, what we create is colored directly by who we are. So, you know, um, if we have a Silicon Valley that is all straight white men creating computer stuff, uh, then technology will be straight white male focused. And um, that's a problem because there are a lot of other people in the world that are that way. And especially as more and more the world runs on computers, it's really, really important that we include everyone, right? Um, and this is, I'm totally ignoring the digital divide of like people that don't even have internet connectivity to their home, like elsewhere outside of you know, the first world. Um, but like disregarding you know, that problem, which is a totally important and separate one, um, you know, you don't want, I, I fear very strongly that as more and more of the world becomes reliant on the internet, that these like groups will continue to maintain their power because they have control over the way we communicate and they're the ones that shape the way that, that we communicate. So, uh, you know, that's, that's really important. So I have, I don't belong here. So, I mean, the sense of fitting in is actually extremely important to people and uh, there was a study on a paper called The Signaling Threat and it talks specifically about conferences. And uh, they framed one conference with a 50-50 uh, gender divide. And they found you know, lots of interest from men and women to go to the conference. And they framed another conference with like a 90-10 gender divide. And they found that you know, there wasn't that much interest in the conference. But the really interesting part was there was more interest by both men and women in the conference that had a more fair split than the conference that was unbalanced. Like, it generally pulls more people in to be part of a diverse community. And similarly, this you know, feeling like you belong really greatly affects the rate of attrition, which specifically in tech is kind of staggering. So we have a hard enough time getting women you know, to come to the table and actually be a part of the tech world. But once they're there, 41% of women and 17% of men quit their careers in tech companies after 10 years. That's a huge chunk and we're starved for workers right now. Everyone is out there looking for you know, talent to get in their companies. I mean. I was hired in my company, I interviewed on Friday, I started on Monday. Like, there, everyone is that starved for t talent. And here we are, you know, kind of actively pushing people out of the door because, you know, they don't feel like they belong and they're in these environments where, you know, they're being harassed or, you know, these microaggressions are kind of slowly digging away at them. So, um, and as an example of how this could change, you know, again, everyone is hiring all the time, right? So if we just reduced female attrition, we didn't attract more women into tech, we just stopped them from all quitting, 
Um, if we did that by 25%, then we would have an extra 220,000 people um, to the talent pool over the next year, right? And like, think about how much more um, awesome you'd be able to have more coworkers, you'd be able to hire people, uh, and you know, we'd have a ton more people building technology. And that's simply by reducing the number of people that try and then quit computer science, not even like attracting new people. Um, so yeah. This is sort of the same deal, I guess. We don't want to like read you a giant quote, but Mary Curie is awesome. Yeah, she's she's pretty amazing. And uh, fun fact about her, she was the first female professor at the University of Paris, but she also did some pretty awesome science things too. <laughs> so the point is, ultimately, of all this stuff, is that we do need to do better, and we're not trying to scold you and tell that you, you that you're all bad. We're trying to provide you with new tools to talk about these subjects and to think about them, because that's really ultimately what um, changes culture. Right, is being able to communicate in different ways or be able to have a reasonable discussion about this. Right, it's impossible. Uh, you know, uh, like so. The thing earlier about Amy, for example, like Amy's an awesome person, but Twitter is not a way to have productive arguments uh, at all. Like I, I, as someone who's gotten into many a Twitter battle, like it's not big <laughs> enough to have any sort of reasonable discussion, right? Because you can't fit the language in there. So we need to actually be able to like, have the words to express these kinds of problems and talk about them seriously. And so we're just trying to demonstrate to you some things about this topic that may interest you. So hopefully you can like, look into them and think about um, your relationships with people and how they work. Um. Um, so one of the big things I think until uh, sort of helping to improve this problem is encouraging anyone that has any interest at all in computing like, because it's, it's hard, right? You're getting started out, and for the longest time, I always heard, you know, just read your manual, do it yourself, whatever, you'll be fine. But then, you know, now my mom, you know, she's in her 50s, and she's like, hey, I wanna learn HTML. And I was like, well, well, I was doing it in third grade, I think you can do it. She's like, I don't know if I can do it. But you need to, like, push these people forward. Let them know that it is possible, you know, you can do it, you can learn these things, and yeah, there's some barrier for entry, but you can be there for them and help them learn. Uh, another thing that you can do, and this is uh, slightly self-serving, obviously, but is contribute to projects that help learners. So, um, you know, this is the reason I started working on Hackity Hack, is that that same problem about, like, specific kinds of people taking over technology, I'm just concerned about the number of people that know about how technology works. So, like, what we do to most people is total magic, right? So, um, I'm interested in raising, you know, getting more and more people involved in technology, period, so that they know the things that affect their daily lives, right? Like, when I swipe my credit card, I know, like, half the technology that makes all that stuff work, so like I'm pretty confident, right? But like uh, people that don't, like it's just total you know, craziness. Like imagine what that's like, right? To like walk through this crazy computerized world, what cars have like over 20 computers in them now um, to help with all sorts of stuff. So like imagine what it's not, not like to know that kind of thing. Um, and so I think it's really unfortunate. And so you can help by helping projects that are helping people learn, which is a lot of helps for one sentence, but whatever. <laughs> Uh, we really need to start mentoring people who need help getting started. Yeah, when I first learned programming, I was sitting alone at my computer just reading everything, asked like a bunch of hackers, what language should I learn first? And they're like, learn C. So I learned C as my first language, which was a fun process. But you really need to sort of like step out there and definitely help, like reach out into your community because there are groups out there that are trying to help learners. And if there aren't, you know, you can start one and you can ask me about starting one because I can help you with that now. Um, but you really need to help learners because you know that barrier for entry is is hard. You know, telling someone RTFM is not a valid answer for a learner that's like, how do I do this? You know, go the extra step and like show them the first beginning steps. Don't do it all for them, but you need to like show them how to progress. And those people are already in the tech world. You need to kind of help them you know, out. You know, someone starting out as young don't, doesn't know what to do. You know. You've been there for a while, probably. A lot of the people here might just be starting out, but many of you have been here for a bit, and you can definitely help out with that. And uh, every little bit helps as far as eliminating bias and stereotyping. Um, this is going to be something that is going to take us as humanity a really long time to get over, and uh, we are probably never going to be perfect at this, but that doesn't mean that it's not worth trying. Um, when you grow up in a patriarchal, homophobic, uh, white supremacist society, it takes a really long time to get over those ingrained notions. So like, I know someone who is raised super religious, and even though she rejects religion now, she still is like, I don't think that being gay is moral because she grew up in that upbringing. And so it's been really hard for her to like, get over these ideas that were implanted in her head when she was really young. So I'm not saying that if you screw up that you're a bad person or whatever, but the point is to try to make an effort to improve, right? Like we work on katas to improve our programming, so you can also work at eliminating bias um, from your social interactions as much as possible, and so that maybe someday we as humanity can get there. Um. 
And like, that's sort of the point is that we want to create, we're working to create a culture that we want uh, people to stay in, right? So um, one of the reasons I care about this is that if I'm working on Hackity Hack and I'm minting brand new programmers, do I really want to bring them into an environment that's going to be hostile to them, right? So like, I don't want to, uh, and I don't, obviously we can't fix it before we start doing this, but like one of the things that conflicts me ethically is that like, if I'm, if I'm gonna encourage women to get into programming and then uh, you know, dudes at their work are gonna sexually harass them, like, is that an ethical action on my part? Like, I don't know, and that's a bigger question, but we wanna work to build that inclusive culture someday is, is sort of the ultimate point. And this is what we're doing here in Pittsburgh. Myself and a couple other awesome women here who should like, stand up or wave their arms or something to show that they're like, all kind of over there are starting Girl Develop at Pittsburgh. And so we're doing this, we're reaching out and you know, we should have classes late October, I mean, no, early October, late September, but you know, we're gonna get more people programming and really reaching out into the community. The other thing you told me this earlier too is that it's not exclusively women. So they're not only accepting women, they're just focusing on trying to get a lot of them too. So it's not about um, separation or exclusion or like hiding women in some sort of bubble. It's just that they're focusing their marketing efforts towards getting girls involved. So yeah, um, so yeah thanks a lot. Um, like I said, I'm Steve. And I'm Lindsay. And uh, yeah, thanks for letting us talk.